In this video, I'll discuss user-defined function blocks within Connected Components Workbench. I've created this custom scene in Factory I.O. to demonstrate how to use these function blocks. It consists of this pick-and-place arm, which moves in a cylindrical coordinate system. The R-axis is positive this direction, and it includes an actuator that requires a 0 to 10 volt analog DC signal. The z-axis is positive down and also has an actuator that requires a 0 to 10 volt analog DC signal. The arm can also rotate, but I've set it up so that it can only rotate clockwise. That should make the programming a little bit easier. And it rotates in 90 degree increments. So all it needs is a Boolean value to activate the rotate command and it will rotate by 90 degrees. Send it another pulse, it'll rotate by 90 again. This is the gripper, and it's actually a suction cup and this is the part that we'll be picking up and placing on different platforms. This one's platform number one, platform number two, platform number three, number four, number five, and number six. Here's a table that shows all of the R and Z coordinates as well as the angle for each of those platforms. We'll be needing these coordinates as we program the automatic motion of this arm. Here's a close-up of the control panel you'll notice that it has a start button and as always when we push the start button and put it in run mode we want that light to turn on it also has a stop button and when we're not in run mode we want the red light to be turned on this digital display should show the R position of the arm at any moment and it should show it in meters ranging between 0 and 1.13 meters this display should show the Z position and it ranges between 0 and 0.63 meters and this display is set up to receive a double integer and it should show the angle that the arm has been rotated to between 0 and 360 degrees and once it gets to 360 degrees it should go back to 0. This section of the control panel here is where we can specify where we want the arm to move. We will push this button when we want it to pick up a new part, we'll push this button when we want it to place that part on platform 1, we'll push this button when we want it to place the part on platform 2, and the same goes with platform 3, 4, 5, and 6. Let's go ahead and run this simulation so I can show you how this PLC program works. I'll push the start button. Notice the green light turns on. And these displays are showing the R, Z, and angle of where the arm is right now. If I push this button, I will tell the arm to pick up a part. and notice it's moving back to the zero zero waiting for some new instructions now I'll tell it to go place that part on platform number one and again it moves back to the safe position waiting further instructions let's tell it to pick up another part and you'll notice that it's moving in 90 degree increments clockwise let's place this on platform two moves back waiting for new instructions Let's pick up another part. Let's tell it to now put that part on platform 6. You'll notice that the angle is showing correctly. It's at 270 degrees right now. If I tell it to move to home, the angle is now showing 0 rather than 360. Let's place this one on platform number 3. Let's get another part. Let's place this one on platform number four. You'll notice that it has to move in the Z direction before it can move in the R direction, or it will risk hitting into some of these platforms. So when we program this, we have to make sure that we move it all the way up in the Z first before we move it in the R. Next I'd like to discuss the code that I generated to operate this automatic pick and place machine. You'll notice first of all that I have the typical start and stop logic here where I turn on a start light in run mode and turn on the stop light when I'm not in run mode. The next section is where I'm simply reading in the sensor for the R position and scaling it and showing the location in meters on the display as well as the Z position and showing its location in meters on the display. The remaining parts of the program are the logic associated with moving the arm and doing it safely. First of all, you'll see this section right here is where I set the desired location. And you've never seen a function like this before because this is one that I've created as a user-defined function block. The operator will push any one of the buttons and based on which button they push, it will output the desired coordinates and gripper state associated with that button. 
you'll notice that this user defined function block also has an enable bit and a done bit. It's important for this automatic pick and place machine to move in the correct sequence so that it doesn't run into anything in its path. That is why each of the user defined function blocks that I'm going to create will have an enable bit and a done bit so that I can facilitate this sequencing. So once I'm done setting the coordinate to the desired location, you'll see that that done bit is now wired into an RS flip-flop which will enable this function here to move the angle to the correct location. And once that's done, it will reset the flip-flop and set this flip-flop here, which will enable the arm to move to the correct R coordinate. Once it's moved to the correct R coordinate, it'll reset itself and signal that we're now ready to set this flip-flop and move to the correct Z coordinate. Once we're done moving to the correct Z coordinate, then the done bit will turn to true and it will reset this flip-flop and send a true to this flip-flop, which will enable this user to find function block to grip or release the part. Once it's done gripping or releasing the part, it will reset this flip-flop and send a signal that we're now ready to move the arm to this home position and wait for their instructions. It'll set this flip-flop and enable the move Z user defined function block moving to a Z coordinate of zero first, so that the Z is moved all the way up before it moves in the R direction. Once the move in the Z is done, it'll reset its flip-flop and set the following flip-flop, which will enable the arm to move in the R direction back to its home position of R equals zero. And once it's done, it will reset its own flip-flop and then wait further instructions. You'll notice throughout this main program that there were five different user-defined functions that I called, and each one of those user-defined functions had an enable and a done bit. Let's take a look more closely at those user-defined function blocks. And let's jump into this first one, the set coordinate. This is the one where, depending on which button is pushed, we pass to the main program the desired R coordinate, Z coordinate, and angle. And before we review this in too much depth, let's take a look at some of the local variables that I set up. You'll see here in the local variables that the first variable that I set up was one that I called enable. It's a Boolean variable. And over here in this column, you'll notice that I can set a specific direction for that variable. And I've set it to be a variable input. Because I set that to be a variable input, the main program passes a value into this variable as one of the inputs. The next variables I created were for buttons 0 through 6. They're also Boolean variables, and I set them as variable inputs as well, because they will receive a value from the main program. The next variable I've created is a done variable, and that has been set as a variable output as well as the gripper state, the R out, Z out, and angle out. Those are all set as variable outputs. So within this user defined function block, you'll notice that all of the rungs have an enable bit in front of them. So none of these rungs will execute until that enable bit is true. They also all have a different button associated with them. For instance, right here, if someone has pushed button zero, then these are the R, Z, and angle coordinates that will be pushed to the output variable. If someone's pushed button number one, then these are the coordinates that will be pushed to the output, and so forth with button number two, and button number three, etc. You'll also notice on the far side of each rung that based on which button gets pushed, I will either set or reset the gripper state. If button zero is pushed, then the gripper state should be turned on, if buttons 1 through 6 are pushed, the gripper state should be reset and turned off. Now let's go to this next user defined function block, move R. We'll go to the local variables first so that you can see what I've set up as inputs and outputs into this function. The first variable, of course, is an enable variable. I don't want this function doing much until it has been enabled. This function also is set to receive as an input the R coordinate. There's also a done variable that I've created that is set to be a variable output. Let's go into this move R to see how it works. There's really only two rungs. You'll notice that both rungs are conditional upon the enable bit being active. And on this first rung, it also depends on the start light being turned on or the machine being in run mode. And if those two conditions are true, then this scaler will take the R coordinate that has been passed into this user defined function block from the main program will scale it to a 0 to 10 volt output signal and send to the actuator on the arm that 0 to 10 volt signal so it will move the arm in the R direction. The second rung is where we determine whether or not this function is done. You'll notice here on the far right 
we have a coil that's connected to that done output variable. This logic right here is where we determine when the arm has actually moved to the prescribed location. First I have a subtraction instruction where I'm taking the desired R coordinate and the actual R position that's displayed and subtracting them to find a difference or in other words the error between the two. And then I go ahead and take the absolute value of that difference to make sure it's always a positive number. And then I compare if that difference is less than 0.05 meters. When it is less than 0.05 meters, then that becomes true, and I will signal that this is now done, that the arm has actually moved close enough to the desired location. Now, the reason I didn't use an equals is because these are real numbers, and the actual position will never be exactly equal to the desired set point. Let's take a look now at the move Z. We'll look at its local variables first. You'll see that I also have an enable, which is set as an input variable to this function. I have a Z coordinate, which is also set as an input, so it receives a value from the main program. And I have a done variable, which is the output from this function, very similar to the move R function block that I created. Here's the logic. You'll notice that it's identical to the move R, with exception that now I'm bringing in a Z coordinate and sending that out to the Z actuator to move the arm. Next, let's look at the move angle function block. We'll look at its local variables first. You'll see that there are just three variables that I've set up. An enable variable, which is set as a variable input. There's an angle variable, which is a double integer, which is also a variable input. And there's also a done variable, which is a Boolean, and it's set up as a variable output. Here's the code for the user-defined function block to move the angle. You'll notice it's a little more complex. There are four different rungs here. You'll notice that all the rungs are conditional upon the enable bit. The first rung is also conditional upon the start button and whether or not the sensor arm is rotating. If the sensor arm is not rotating, then I check to see if the desired angle set point is not equal to the actual rotation angle at the display. And if they're not equal, then I will send a true to the actuator that rotates the arm clockwise. Once I've set that, then the arm will start to rotate. And this second rung will see a pulse that the arm has started to rotate. Once that pulse has been sensed, then I will go ahead and take the rotation angle value on the digital display and add 90 degrees to it. And that will be the new value. Because every time I send a pulse to the actuator that rotates the arm clockwise, it will only rotate 90 degrees. That's why I'm adding just 90 degrees here. The next rung will check to see when the angle on the digital display is equal to 360 degrees, because when it is equal to 360 degrees, then we just need to move a zero into that display, because we don't want to display 360 and go above 360 degrees on the display. And this final rung is where we check to see if the displayed rotation angle is equal to the desired angle set point. And once it is, then we'll turn on the done bit and allow the next operation to proceed. Now finally, let's take a look at this user-defined function block where we determine whether to grip or release the part. The local variables I've set up here are, of course, an enable bit that's set up as a variable input, the input gripper state, which is set up as a variable input, of course, a done bit, which is set up as, as a variable output, and the output gripper state, which is also, of course, set up as a variable output. This is a fairly straightforward set of logic. It's just one rung. When the enable bit is true, we will go ahead and move the input gripper state to an output gripper state and then turn on the done bit. So when we go back to this overall program, you'll see that when this user-defined function block of grip or release the part is enabled, we will simply take that gripper state and tell the actuator whether to grip or release the part. So that the actuator won't grip or release the part when we push the button, but it'll wait till the arm has moved to the correct angle, R and Z coordinate, before either gripping or releasing the part.